We're now thinking about the stages of shock, and I just want to talk about shock as being in three simple stages. Compensated shock, progressive shock, and then finally irreversible shock. So first of all, let's think about compensated shock. Now this is sometimes called non-progressive shock because the blood pressure is not going down. And the reason for this is when the shock starts, when the blood pressure starts to go down just a little bit, then there are compensatory mechanisms kicking. So there are neurological compensatory mechanisms that will increase the heart rate and cause the peripheral vasoconstriction and reduce the blood flow to the hands and feet. The neurological compensation. And also the endocrine system initiates compensatory mechanisms releasing uh, hormones such as renin, if you want to classify renin as a hormone, uh, releasing hormones such as antidiuretic hormone. Now, the renin will stimulate the angiotensin system, the renin-angiotensin system, and that will cause vasoconstriction, which will increase the blood pressure. Antidiuretic hormone will conserve water and will also be vasoconstricting. And there can be increased absorption of fluids from the gut and from the tissues to try and restore intravascular volume, to try and maintain venous return and therefore to maintain cardiac output. So there are compensatory mechanisms and this is also useful for us because we can recognise that these are happening. So we can see the pallor caused by the vasoconstriction. We can feel the fast pulse and we can think yes this patient is in shock but the blood pressure is not dropping yet because they are compensating. So it's important to realise this, the pala and the tachycardia occur before the blood pressure starts to drop. So in compensated shock, neurological and endocrine based compensatory mechanisms will maintain blood pressure at least for a period of time. And clinically, we should be recognising that the patient is becoming shocked at this compensated stage. Because at this stage, the blood pressure is going to be maintained, the circulatory system, the blood vessels themselves, and the organs of the body are going to be protected from damage because of these compensatory mechanisms. Now, if the cause of the shock is still progressing, these will only work for a period of time, but this is the ideal time for you to recognise that these compensatory mechanisms are occurring and to treat the underlying cause, the underpinning cause of the shock before it gets any worse. So ideally, the patient only gets to the compensated stage of shock and because of your intervention, they do not go on to the progressive stage of shock. So the three stages of shock are compensated, progressive, and irreversible. And now we're talking about progressive shock. This is sometimes called decompensated. The compensatory mechanisms are no longer working and the patient is decompensating and the blood pressure starts to fall. Now in the old days, we used to define shock as a falling blood pressure, as a state of acute hypotension. But this definition is not adequate. It is about the perfusion of the tissues because a patient can be in compensated shock. And actually, when the blood pressure starts to fall in progressive shock, this is an ominous development in shock. So by the time the patient's blood pressure starts to fall, it's already an ominous development. They're in progressive shock. They have decompensated and their overall condition will be deteriorating. And the blood pressure will progressively fall as the progressive shock gets worse. So in progressive shock, the blood pressure progressively falls. And there's going to be increased hypoperfusion of the kidneys, the brain, the gut, the myocardium, the lungs, the actual medulla oblongata itself, which is controlling the compensatory mechanisms, will become hypoperfused. And also, 
as the blood pressure drops, there's adverse effects on the blood vessels themselves. And a patient will be in progressive shock for a period of time, but then they will pass over into irreversible shock. Now, if you're by the bedside observing the patient at that time, you can't tell when they've passed from progressive shock into irreversible shock. But there'll be irreversible physiological changes that will take place in the patient's body as the, at a particular stage in the progressive shock. So in the progressive shock, the blood pressure is falling and you really have to intervene at this stage because if you don't, the patient will go into irreversible shock. You might not be able to see when that happens, but it will happen. So the progressive stage of shock when the blood pressure is dropping is the last window of opportunity for curative treatment. So intervene effectively at this stage and the patient can still make a complete and full recovery. Fail to intervene effectively at this stage and the patient will go on into irreversible shock, which we'll look at next. After a patient's been in progressive shock for a period of time, they will go into irreversible shock. And this occurs when there is irreversible damage to essential organs and to the whole vascular system in the body. It will not recover. So at this stage, in irreversible shock, the patient is still alive, but unfortunately, because of the irreversible physiological damage that's occurred in the body, will go on to die of shock. Now, with your interventions, you might still be able to increase the blood pressure for a period of time. And of course, this is worth trying because when you look at the patient, you can't really tell whether they're in late progressive shock or early irreversible shock. But if the patient is in irreversible shock, your interventions can increase the patient's blood pressure for a period of time. You might become hopeful that things are getting better, but because the irreversible damage has already occurred, the patient actually will go on and, and, and die from the shock, unfortunately. And the, the moral of this uh, stage is, is simple. Treat the shock before they get to the irreversible stage, because at that stage, it's already too late, unfortunately. Now, the concept of the golden hour was developed in traumatology. People working in trauma units realised that if you could arrest the cause of the shock, stop the bleeding or whatever it was that was causing the shock, and then get the patient's blood pressure back up to reasonable levels within one hour, the patient was much more likely to survive. And they re reasoned that there was an hour of golden opportunity to treat the patients. Now this is certainly true in the trauma situation, whether it's a hemorrhagic or a non-hemorrhagic cause of shock, as we've discussed, but it's true with all forms of shock. Treatment should begin as soon as possible. Treat these patients ASAP, or within one hour at the absolute latest, if you're going to give them a reasonable chance of survival. If a patient's in severe shock for an hour, and you intervene after an hour, they might have already gone into the irreversible stage of shock. So in the case of trauma, stop the bleeding, treat the injuries, restore the blood pressure within one hour, and the patient is much more likely to survive, greatly improves their prognosis. Your hour of golden opportunity. Now, with other forms of shock, we might need to treat them even earlier than this. Anaphylactic shock, for example, that they need treated within a few minutes. But treat the patients as soon as possible. But of course, remember, the golden hour does not begin when the patient comes into your department. The golden hour begins when the patient is actually injured. So if there's a 20 minute delay from the patient getting picked up from the road traffic accident, to being admitted to your department, you've only got 40 minutes of your hour 
a golden opportunity left. Use it well.